discover a dazzling world of adventure and illusion. Labyrinth, a novel based on the Jim Henson film by A.C.H. Smith, read by Rose in the Library. Chapter 1 The White Owl Nobody saw the owl, white in the moonlight, black against the stars. Nobody heard him as he glided over on silent wings of velvet. The owl saw and heard everything. He settled in a tree, his claws hooked on a branch, and he stared at the girl in the glade below. The wind moaned, rocking the branch scudding low clouds across the evening sky. It lifted the hair of the girl. The owl was watching her with his round, dark eyes. The girl moved slowly from the trees toward the middle of the glade, where a pool glimmered. She was concentrating. Each deliberate step took her nearer to her purpose. Her hands were open, and held slightly in front of her. The wind sighed again in the trees. It blew her cloak tightly against her slender figure and rustled her hair around her wide-eyed face. Her lips were parted. Give me the child, Sarah said, in a voice that was low but firm with the courage her quest needed. She halted, her hands still held out. Give me the child, she repeated. Through dangers untold and hardships unnumbered, I have fought my way here to the castle beyond the Goblin City to take back the child you have stolen. She bit her lip and continued. For my will is as strong as yours, and my kingdom is great. She closed her eyes tightly. Thunder rumbled. The owl blinked once. My will is as strong as yours. Sarah spoke with even more intensity now. And my kingdom is great. She frowned and her shoulders dropped. Oh, damn, she muttered. Reaching under her cloak, she brought out a book. Its title was the labyrinth. Holding the book up before her, she read aloud from it. In the fading light, it was not easy to make out the words. You have no power over me. She got no further. Another clap of thunder nearer this time made her jump. It also alarmed a big, shaggy sheepdog who had not minded sitting by the pool and being admonished by Sarah but who now decided that it was time to go home, and said so with several sharp barks. Sarah held her cloak around her. It did not give her much warmth, being no more than an old curtain, cut down and fastened at the neck by a glass brooch. She ignored Merlin, the sheepdog, while concentrating on learning the speech in the book. You have no power over me, she whispered. She closed her eyes again and repeated the phrase several times. A clock above the little pavilion in the park chimed seven times and penetrated Sarah's concentration. She stared at Merlin. Oh, no, she said. I don't believe it. That was seven, wasn't it? Merlin stood up and shook himself sensing that some more interesting action was due. Sarah turned and ran. Merlin followed. The thunderclouds splattered them both with large drops of rain. The owl had watched it all. When Sarah and Merlin left the park, he sat still on his branch, in no hurry to follow them. This was his time of day. He knew what he wanted. An owl is born with all his questions answered.
all the way down the street, which was lined on both sides with privet-hedged Victorian houses similar to her own. Sarah was muttering to herself, It's not fair! It's not fair! The mutter had turned to a gasp by the time she came within sight of her home. Merlin, having bounded along with her on his shaggy paws, was wheezing too. His mistress, who normally moved at a gentle, dreamy pace, had this odd habit of liking to sprint home from the park in the evening. Perhaps that owl had something to do with it. Merlin was not sure. He didn't like the owl, he knew that. It's not fair! Sarah was close to sobbing. The world at large was not fair, hardly ever. But in particular, her stepmother was ruthlessly not fair to her. There she stood now in the front doorway of the house, all dressed up in that frightful dark blue evening gown of hers, the fur coat left open to reveal the low cut of the neckline, her awful necklace vulgarly winking above her freckled breast, and wouldn't you know, she was looking at her watch. Not just looking at it, but staring at it to make good and sure that Sarah would feel guilty before she was accused. Again. As Sarah came to a halt on the path in the front garden, she could hear her baby brother, Toby, bawling inside the house. He was her half-brother, really, but she did not call him that, not since her school friend Alice had asked, What's the other half of him, then? And Sarah had been unable to think of an answer. Half nothing to do with me. That was no good. It wasn't true, either. Sometimes she felt fiercely protective of Toby, wanted to dress him up and carry him in her arms and take him away from all this to a better place, a fairer world, an island somewhere, perhaps. At other times, and this was one, she hated Toby, who had twice as many parents in attendance on him as she had. When she hated Toby, it frightened her, because it led her into thinking about how she could hurt him. There must be something wrong with me, she would reflect, that I can even think of hurting someone I dote upon, or is it that there is something wrong in doting upon someone I hate? She wished she had a friend who would understand the dilemma and maybe explain it to her, but there was no one. Her friends at school would think her a witch if she even mentioned the idea of hurting Toby, and as for her father, it would frighten him even more than it frightened Sarah herself. So she kept the perplexity well hidden. Sarah stood before her stepmother and deliberately held her head high. I'm sorry, she said, in a bored voice, to show that she wasn't sorry at all, and anyway it was unnecessary to make a thing out of it. Well, her stepmother told her, don't stand out there in the rain, come on. She stood aside to make room for Sarah to pass her in the doorway, and she glanced again at her wristwatch. Sarah made a point of never touching her stepmother, not even brushing against her clothes. She edged inside, close to the door frame. Merlin started to follow her. Not the dog, her stepmother said. But it's pouring. Her stepmother wagged her finger at Merlin twice. In the garage, you, she commanded. Go on. Merlin dropped his head and loped around to the side of the house. Sarah watched him go in bitter lip. Why, she wondered for the trillionth time, does my stepmother always have to put on this performance when they go out in the evening? It was so hammy. That was one of Sarah's favorite words, since she had heard her mother's co-star, Jeremy, use it to put down another actor in the play they were doing. Such a rag-bag of over-the-top clichés. She remembered how Jeremy had sounded French when he said clichés, thrilling her with his sophistication. 
Why couldn't her stepmother find a new way into the park? Oh, she loved the way in which Jeremy talked about other actors. She was determined to become an actress herself so that she could talk like that all the time. Her father seldom talked at all about people at his office, and when he did, it was dreary in comparison. Her stepmother closed the front door, looked at her watch once more, took a deep breath, and started one of her cliched speeches. Sarah, you're an hour late. Sarah opened her mouth, but her stepmother cut her off with a little humorless smile. Please let me finish, Sarah. Your father and I go out very rarely. You go out every weekend, Sarah interrupted rapidly. Her stepmother ignored that, and I ask you to babysit only if it won't interfere with your plans. How would you know... Sarah had half turned away so as not to flatter her stepmother with her attention, and was busy with putting her book on the hall stand, unclipping her brooch, and folding the cloak over her arm. You don't know what my plans are. You don't ask me. She glanced at her own face in the mirror of the hall stand, checking that her expression was cool and poised, not over the top. She liked the clothes she was wearing, a cream-colored shirt with full sleeves, a brocaded waistcoat loosely over the shirt, blue jeans and a leather belt. She turned even farther away from her stepmother to check on how her shirt hung from her breasts down to her waist. She tucked it in a little at the belt to make it tighter. Her stepmother was watching her coldly. I am assuming you would tell me if you had a date. I would like it if you had a date. A fifteen-year-old girl should have dates. Well, Sarah was thinking, if I did have a date, you are the last person I would tell. What a hammy, no, tacky view of life you do have. She smiled grimly to herself. Perhaps I will have a date, she thought. Perhaps I will, but you will not like it, not one bit. When you see who's dating me, I doubt you will see him. All you will know about it is hearing the front door shut behind me, and you will sneak to the window, as you always do, and poke your nose between those horrid, phony lace curtains you put up there, and you will see the taillight of a wicked dove gray limousine vanishing round the corner. And after that, you will keep seeing pictures in the magazines of the two of us, together in Bermuda and San Tropez. And there will be nothing at all you can possibly do about it, for all your firm views on bedtimes and developmental psychology and my duties and rolling up the toothpaste tube from the bottom. Oh, stepmother, are you going to be sorry when you read in vogue about the cosmic cash that Hollywood producers are offering us for... Sarah's father came down the stairs into the hall. In his arms he was carrying Toby, clad in red and white striped pajamas. He patted the baby's back. Oh, Sarah, he said mildly. You're here at last. We were worried about you. Oh, leave me alone. Afraid that she might be close to tears, Sarah gave them no chance to reason with her. She ran upstairs. They were always so reasonable, particularly her father, so long-suffering and mild with her, so utterly convinced that they were always obviously in the right, and that it was only a matter of time before she consented to do as they wished. Why did her father always take that woman's side? Her mother never wore that look of pain tolerance. She was a woman who could shout and laugh and hug you and slap you all within a minute or two. When she and Sarah had a quarrel, it was an explosion. Five minutes later, it was forgotten. In the hallway, her stepmother had sat down, still in her fur coat. Wearily, she was saying, I don't know what to do any more. She treats me like the wicked stepmother in a fairy tale, no matter what I say. I have tried, Robert. Well, Sarah's father patted Toby thoughtfully. It is hard to have your mother walk out on you at that age. At any age, I suppose. 
That's what you always say, and of course you're right. But will she never change? Holding Toby in one arm, Robert patted his wife on the shoulder. I'll go and talk to her.